Especially for the youth, trying to do a media fast here throughout this week, uh, through the next uh, Sunday, to try to prepare our hearts. I believe the Lord has some things He wants to say in our youth convention. It's going to be starting tomorrow. We'll be going down to York, Pennsylvania. That's going to be 7:30 p.m. It's going to be the first service, and there's a day session Friday, and then uh, evening service. On Friday, and then uh, another one in the morning on Saturday. I, I do want to mention just mention the schedule too, because we uh, and years past have uh, it's been open to the public, even if you didn't have a registration for the evening service. But this year, due to restrictions and stuff, they have to abide by. Um, uh, it will only be if you have a registration that you can make it down to the service. So it is limited capacity. They have 150 people that are able to be registered and get in there and so those of us that have the registrations are going to be the only ones however they will be live streaming the services if you need information on where you can find that on facebook just let me know and um we'll get you the details on that so you can participate virtually so you'll be able to might be able to see our youth in the service while you're there and feel like you're part of the service uh in york amen so thankful for the opportunity to be able to do that. Again, it's one of the benefits that we've experienced through this past year is ways that we can we can broadcast services and things like that and kind of connect each other despite being distant from each other. Amen? Yeah. Um, that's about all there is in the way of announcements for this week, but really excited about what the Lord's going to Youth Convention. Again, it's, it's an exciting time because it is the first youth event that we've had since Youth Convention last time, which ended the day that everything shut down. So we're so thankful to get back into that. I'm so thankful, uh, looking forward to what the Lord is going to say to us. But uh, more more urgently, I am excited what the Lord is going to say to us tonight. So thank you, Brother Juwan, and his uh, sensitivity to the Spirit and being willing to uh, listen to what the Lord has to say and, and come and bring the Word to us tonight. Amen. Would you get behind him and preach with him tonight? Yes. 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 Thank you. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Such a wonderful presence of the Lord in here. Amen. Amen. And thank you for all of those who have prayed um, for this service because uh, Amen. I can certainly tell somebody was praying. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, would you turn yes, with me to the book of James? Hallelujah. We're going to be in chapter 2. I want to give honor to my pastor to the leadership of this church because we certainly have some amazing leadership. Amen. I thank Amen. God for them and for trusting me to speak to you all, especially to our youth um, as they get ready for youth convention. Um, I've never really felt old before, but today, today is certainly moving me in that direction. We're going to be uh, in James chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 14, and this is what it says. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, but doesn't have works? Can faith save him? We're going to move to verse 17, and it says, Even so faith, if it have not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils believe. Also, and they tremble. Yes, they do. But wilt thou know a vain man All faith right. without works is dead? Mm -hmm. I'm going to skip to the last verse, 26. And it says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, mm. even so faith, faith without, without works, works. Amen. is dead. Amen. And tonight I want to speak to you briefly on this topic. When our faith gets out of shape. Wow. Mm. 
Would you pray with me? Come on yes. in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you, God, for trusting me with another chance to speak to your people. In the Holy Ghost, God. Lord, I give you all the credit, God, for what I have to say to you, God, and I'm trusting you to give me the words to speak. Hallelujah. I pray, Lord, that you would move in this house and you would move in every single home of those viewing this service. And I pray, God, that you would have your way and you would do exactly what it is you want to do. Lord, we give you all the credit, God. We lift you up and we glorify you, Jesus. Lord, we praise you, oh God, because there's no like you. Where you are, could you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Lord, we thank you. Lord, we glorify you. We thank the party in this house. Hallelujah. 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 There's no like you, Jesus. We lift you up, oh God. We praise your name. There's no like you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 You can be seated. Thank you for standing so long. <laughs> it had only been a few years after the Second World War that Phil Knight had graduated from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Throughout his years at college, he had ran distance for the track team, and he had witnessed firsthand how much potential the sport had. While trying to establish himself as an entrepreneur, he realized that Japanese companies were capable to compete with the best of all American camera companies, and they were putting them out of business. They were, they were doing pretty good. And he was curious to see if the same could be accomplished for athletic footwear. After flying to Japan and establishing a partnership um, with a shoe manufacturer, Phil Knight returned to the United States and began his company, The Blue Ribbon Shoes. For years, he drove to every race that he knew about, and he was selling these shoes out of the trunk of his car. Uh, not, not a lot of people wanted them, um, but he didn't give up. He had a little bit of success after he worked out a little bit, but he wanted to go further. He knew that there was more that could come out of this. And he would go back to his old track coach and say, hey, could you help me out? And uh, he would eventually make him a co-owner of the company. And with his guidance, he would soon be selling shoes at the 1968 Olympics. He and his newly established team saw that this, this, this idea that we have, it, it can go somewhere, it can do something, but we've got we've to put some work behind it. Uh, and they did that indeed. They changed everything, a complete makeover to the company. They created a logo. They changed the name and adopted a, a slogan that matched their mindset. Just do it. Today, Nike is the number one shoe company in the world. And not only that, but it's the highest grossing sportswear corporation in the world. This company that is now worth over $30 billion didn't start just because the idea looked good on paper. It only exists today because someone made up in their minds, I am going to do what I know can be achieved no matter what happens, no matter what comes my way. This is my dream, and I'm going to make sure it happens. And I just want to remind somebody that there is a race that we are running, and there is a goal that we are trying to achieve, and we can't let ourselves get distracted by the stuff that goes along in the world because if we don't, we miss out on the goal that's at the finish line. Amen. We live in... In a, in a time when everybody wants what they want right now. Mm. They want what they want when they want it. Or right now, J.G. Wentworth kind of society. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody is willing to wait for anything. Mm -hmm. If you invest in something and you don't see the immediate benefit of it, no one wants it. Uh, they think it's not valuable. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, as many of you know, I do work at Chick-fil-A, and I can tell you firsthand, um, if you have to be the person to go to the window and say, I'm sorry, we're out of nuggets, or I'm sorry, we're out of that <laughs> item that you're asking for. We don't have Chick-fil-A sauce. <laughs> that is never a good place to be. <laughs> it's never a good place. In our opening verses, the writer James tells us that belief without action behind it doesn't accomplish anything. So many times throughout Scripture and in our day-to-day -day lives, we are told to exercise our faith and to work out our own salvation. And just like anything else, if our faith isn't put to action, if we don't put some effort behind it, it will get out of shape. Amen. So in an attempt to save people from unfit faith, James gives some examples mm -hmm. of what it looks like when somebody puts their faith to action. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I'm just going to take a few minutes this evening to tell you about those people. The first of these was Abraham. Right. You think that somebody that was called to be the father of so much would have had it made in the shape of a glass of lemonade or something, you know, you would have had it put all together, but... That certainly was not the case. Hallelujah. You would think that he would have everything exactly how it ought to be, you know, ideal, just perfect, 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 lined up right after the other, but that was simply not the case. Yeah. He didn't start off with a whole lot. He was born in the city of Ur as Abram. He had two brothers. He, 
and his city didn't really have much to offer him. What I'm, what I'm trying to convey to you this evening is that the man that we know as the father of the faithful didn't have the perfect origin story. His yeah. parents were not followers of the one true God. They were idol worshipers. Mm -hmm. His town was not known for having the largest or most popular church. It was known for building temples to false gods. Mm -hmm. I just want to echo the words of our pastor from Sunday morning. You may not have had control over the first couple chapters of your life, but that doesn't mean that the story isn't worth writing. Come that doesn't on. mean that the story isn't worth investing in. That doesn't Come mean on. that it's not worth continuing and, and giving it over to God. Come because on. if you give a messed up story to God, he can turn it into a masterpiece. Yes. If you're willing to see it out to the end, God can do something absolutely gorgeous with your life. Amen. And God had extended the same offer to Abram. Mm -hmm. God told him, if you leave everything you know, if you leave it all behind and you go where I send you, I'll make something great starting with your life. Mm -hmm. The Lord doesn't make bad deals. Mm -hmm. no. Abraham was 75 years old, but he was still willing to enter a covenant with God. Mm -hmm. It's never too late to enter a covenant with God. Amen. Abraham did not know where his journey would take him. He didn't know what was what he was going to encounter. He, he, didn't, he didn't even really know who this God was. But because God was willing to do something in his life, he went where God wanted him to go. I don't know about you, but it's such a privilege for God to look at my life and say, you know what? That's something I can, I can do something with that. I can make something great out of that. God is trying to perform a good work in us. And what a shame it would be if the only reason it didn't come to pass is because we didn't believe it could happen. Amen. We need to put our faith into action because when we don't, we close the door on God and he does not force his way back in. Right. Amen. He's a gentleman like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we don't want him in there, he's not going to force himself back in there. He'll ask. But he'll never force himself. Scripture tells us that Abram, his wife Sarai, and his nephew Lot would travel to Egypt and they would, they would gain wealth and they, they, they would experience a whole lot of stuff. They would go through battles and not everything was great, but God was talking with them. He was walking with them. He was by their side every single step of the way. He even changed their names to Abram and Sarai in preparation for what he was about to do in their lives. But it was only while they were in the waiting period for their promise that they got impatient and tried to fulfill it on their own. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes we look at how long um, it's, it's taken for God's word to fulfill itself and we start to worry a little bit. Come on. We start to panic sometimes and we say, God, I thought, I thought that you said you were going to do this. I thought that Amen. you said you were going to fulfill this promise. But I want to remind you, if he promised you something, he's going to bring it to pass yeah. and it will happen. And I just want to remind you, if you have to wait for it, I can assure you it's something worth waiting for. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's something yeah. worth Hallelujah. waiting for. God, right. you, you never enter into a covenant with God and say, man, that was less than what I expected. Uh, that was lackluster. That never happens with God. If you have to wait for what he's trying to do, Amen. you better brace for impact is all I got to say. Yes. God is going to do something great, but we got to be willing to see it out to the end. Yes. Abraham would, would have a son with a, with a servant, Hagar, and name him Ishmael. But this was not the way that God wanted to bring about his promise. Amen. Ishmael would grow up in Abraham's house for several years. Abraham trained him, he taught him, he, he loved him. He, he sincerely did love Ishmael. But there, there was a problem that would occur later down the line. God would provide Isaac through a miracle birth, and there was an issue that, that came up. Paul would describe it as one son being born of the flesh, and the other being born of promise. Let me tell you, if you're walking, if you're walking this thing to get what God really is trying to do for you, then there's going to be some times when your flesh comes at odds with your promise. Amen. Amen. We're going to have to conquer our flesh. We're going to have to fight our flesh and put that stuff aside if we're really going to be in a yeah. place to receive what God yeah. is trying to give to us. And I'm not trying to say that Abraham was right for doing what he did. Mm. God set him forth a promise. He said, this is how I'm going to do it. This will happen. And he went another way. I'm not saying that that's right. Amen. But he was now at a place where a decision needed to be made. Right. Amen. Will I walk the path that I've paved for myself? Or will I run the race that leads to God's reward? Amen. There is a question that we need to ask ourselves when we're walking down this path with God. Am I going to continue on the path that I know is wrong? Or will right. I turn my path to the one that I know right. God wants Amen. me to be on? Yeah. There is a promise that we can only receive if we do it God's way. Amen. God, God isn't, you know, we, we try to think sometimes that God is, you know, uh, we can go a back door with God or try to do some secondary method with God. But God doesn't work like that. Right. 
He's fair. He's just. And he, if, if, he, if he only set one way to do it, it's not because that way is impossible. It's because that way is right. Amen. Right. Abraham chose to obey the path that God set for him, which was the correct option in case there was any question out there. Um, but it was a tough one still. Many had to give up Hagar and Ishmael. They had to give up a son, which was a tough choice. And scripture says that he gave them food, he gave them water, and he sent them out. This area that they lived in, you know, the Middle East, it was not very forgiving to those that didn't know how to survive in it. Um, we're told that after a little bit, you know, they had been traveling some time and there came a point where they didn't have any water anymore. Mm -hmm. And not having water in a desert is a big issue. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hagar was convinced that she and her son were going to die. So she placed them under a tree. She walked away and she wept. Mm -hmm. She was in a tough spot. Uh, she had no means of providing for her family. Uh, but the Bible says that God heard the voice of Ishmael mm. and showed up in their situation. I said earlier that you're never too old to start a covenant with God, but I want you to know that you're never too young to start one with God either. It was only when this teenager cried out to God in the midst of this desert situation that God opened up a door that could work in his family. Not only that, but it allowed God to reestablish a covenant, a covenant relationship with his mother from before he was born. This boy's prayers allowed God to have a relationship with Hagar that he was not able to have before. I just want to remind somebody, our youth especially, your prayers have impact beyond what you can imagine. They have impact beyond what you realize. If you're praying for somebody, if you're praying for your parents, your lost family members, God hears that, and you're giving them a chance to work in a, in a way that nobody else really has given them. Amen. Some, some time would pass, and Isaac would grow up. Um, Abraham would teach him and love him and train him, just like he did Ishmael, and he loved him very, very much. And... Scripture says that the Lord, he, te he tested Abraham. And he said, take your son, your only son, who you love, and offer him as a burnt sacrifice unto me. Mm -hmm. As I was preparing for tonight, uh, I learned that this was the first time that the word love is used in the Bible. So this is a big deal. Uh, mm -hmm. Abraham, he did love Isaac. And I don't think we realize sometimes how big of a deal this was. For Abraham, he and Sarah knew that they could not have natural children by any other means, especially not at the age that they currently were. But God told them that they would have kids, and that's what they followed after. They pursued after that. They abandoned everything they knew. And for the next 25 years, their faith had the work out of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. God, wasn't asking, God wasn't asking someone who was still trying to figure out life to sacrifice. He was asking someone who had spent some serious time waiting for what they currently have. Amen. I said it once and I'll say Amen. it once again. God does not ask for sacrifice because he wants us to have less or because he wants All us right. to suffer. He asks us to sacrifice either to prepare us for more or to show us the true value of what we currently have. Amen. There is a power in sacrifice Amen. that we cannot, we cannot just let pass. If God is asking you to sacrifice, yeah. that's for your benefit. That is for your benefit. All because it looks like it's less doesn't mean that the value of what you're doing is less. Amen. Abraham took God at his word. He said, God, you, you brought me through before. Okay, I'm going to do it again. Okay. And uh, he got ready the next morning for a sacrifice. Yeah. He would prepare everything that he needed, and they would make their way up Mount Moriah. Um, this couldn't have been the first time that this father and son had gone to worship in this way, because while they were going up the mountain, um, Isaac began to do an inventory check. You know, he said, he said, mm -hmm. Dad, you know, I see, I see some fire. He's like, check. Uh, I see wood. Check. Where is the sacrifice? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like, you know, it's like you knock, knock, and no one says who's there. You know? <laughs> Where's the sacrifice, Dad? Uh -huh. Eventually, Abraham did, he did say something. He simply responded, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I can only imagine what must have gone through Isaac's mind when he got to the mountaintop started building an altar, but there were no goats. Mm -hmm. You can only imagine what happened when he looked around a little bit further and didn't see any sheep. Mm -hmm. um, he, must have, he must have known what, what that had meant. I, I can only imagine what went through his mind when Abraham said, can you hand me the rope? Mm -hmm. And began to tie him down upon the altar. Mm -hmm. We usually read these scriptures and talk about the faith of Abraham, but nowhere in the Bible does it record that Isaac ever resisted. That's right. 
Isaac knew what was about to happen on an altar like this. This young man found himself in an altar, and the only thing that could be offered to God was his life, and he did not resist. The greatest leaps we take toward God are when we're at an altar and there's nothing else to offer but our lives. I just want to tell somebody that you don't have to live off of someone else's sacrifice. You don't have to live off of somebody else's relationship with you. God wants to have a personal relationship with you. He wants to have an individual relationship with you. Something special for you. And the only way, and it's a really easy way, the only way to get there is to say, God, here's an altar. Here is my life. I give it to you. Amen. 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 It's that easy. God doesn't, God doesn't do things, you know, the hard way. We like to overcomplicate the way he does stuff, but it's very straightforward. Amen. The Lord would stop Abraham before slaying Isaac and would indeed provide a sacrifice for himself right. in the form of a ram. Amen. The Lord may have been the God of Abraham when they went up that mountain, but he was the God of Abraham and Isaac when they went back down. Amen. Even to this day, we still know him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Your faith and your sacrifice can establish a relationship with God that reach beyond just your life. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I, I question that for a little while. It's like, you know, because I don't, I don't write these notes. God writes them, you know. Uh, and it's like, God, how can, how can a relationship have impact after someone's gone? Mm-hmm. You know, we, we hear yeah. nobody in the Bible, but Jesus is still here, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Their lives still impact us today. Amen. Their lives still influence us today in your life, your relationship with God can still have that kind of impact even after you're gone. Amen. Amen. James would write of a second person um, and, and her, her name was Rahab. If there was such thing as picking the opposite of Abraham, yeah. it was probably Rahab. She was a Gentile innkeeper from the <laughs> land of Jericho and when we first meet her, Abraham's descendants were trying to claim Uh, the land of her people, and they were not too fond of that idea. Uh, Joshua would send spies into the land of Jericho to scope out the enemy and just to see, you know, how much, you know, do what spies do, just see how much they had going on about Mm them. But uh, things got got pretty uh, sketchy really quickly because eventually we would uh, find these spies in Rahab's home with the king's servants knocking on the door looking for them. The closest thing that most of us probably have experienced is something like this, it's like a game of hide and seek when someone has a good spot and you don't want to spoil it. But Rahab had a much more serious situation on her hands. She had heard the stories of the Red Sea. She had heard about how God provided for the Israelites on so many other occasions that we always made a way for his people. And in that moment, she had a decision too. She thought it better to put her faith in a God that she did not know than to stay with what was familiar, knowing that she would lose everything. I think sometimes we persuade ourselves that no one wants to hear the gospel anymore. We persuade ourselves that no one wants to hear our testimony anymore, but I'm going to use our pastor's word, fiction. That is not true. The only thing that Rahab knew about God was what those stories were. The only thing she knew about God was a testimony. And sometimes I don't think we realize how how powerful your testimony is. It is powerful, it is influential, it is important. and And sometimes the only reason someone else thinks to activate their faith Amen. is because they see how God responds when you activate yours. Yes. Amen. You Amen. Your testimony is important. Amen. It is a valuable tool in your arsenal. And if you never tell anybody your testimony, what was, what was the purpose of enduring it? Thank you, Lord. It is special to you. It is unique to you. God has given you something that isn't wrapped up in these 66 books. That, not a lot of people can say that. Right. But why don't we use it? Mm-hmm. And Rahab, she made the choice, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try God too. And she would ward off the pursuers, and she would instruct the spies on how to get home safely. And she explained to them that she knew that the Lord was going to destroy the city. And like I said, she heard <coughs> these situations before, and there was no question if God was going to destroy her city too. She knew. And this is what she asked of the spies. She said, I spared the two of you. Mm-hmm. Promise me that the Lord your God will spare me and my family. Let my family come out of this place alive. She got a red rope, she tied it to her window, and she let him down. And the spies told her when they were at the bottom, if you uh, let this rope that you bound to the window, if you let it here, when we return, everybody in your house will be spared. Mm. Amen. They didn't tell her how long it was going to take. Uh, they didn't tell her how long they were going to be gone away. So I 
can only imagine how, how hard it must have been to get all of her, you know, siblings, her, her parents into that house and to just keep them there, you know? Kind of puts you in the mind of what we've been experiencing these past few months, don't you think? You know? You don't know when you're going to get out, but you know that someday you will. Amen. But the day came for her city to be conquered. And scripture says the Israelites utterly destroyed the city. But they saw the scarlet rope and spared Rahab's family. We look at a life like hers and some of us think, well, she only reached her family. That's, that's not a whole lot of people, you know, four, five, six people, but it might be. <laughs> but I, 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 want, I want to point something out to you. The book of Hebrews looks at this situation and counts her as a champion of the faith. And James recorded her, her faith. It counted her as an example of how we ought to be using our faith. Not only that, but in Matthew chapter 1, we see the descendants of Rahab. And they include David, Solomon, and even the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, we, we might not have a red rope to point somebody to sometimes, but we do have a red river that leads back to Calvary's tree. Oh, it, yes. it does not matter what somebody's oh, life looks like. Yes. It does not matter what their life looks like. Amen. God can get a hold of them. God can reach their family. Yeah. You get one person that's valuable to God. One person is all that he cares about. If, he, if we can get one, he's happy with that. She got a little bit more than that. And she was counted as a champion of the faith and was grafted into the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's a big deal. Yes. Yes. It's a big deal. Amen. If we can point somebody to Jesus, then their faith can stand even when the walls of their life start crumbling down. I didn't have a tremendous amount to say to you this evening. But um, in the final verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul compares uh, his personal commitment to that of an athlete. And one translation records it this way. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, right. but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it so they can win a prize that will eventually fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. Yeah. Right. So I run with yes. purpose in every step. Yeah. I'm not yeah. just shadow boxing. Right. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Mm. Paul makes it very clear that we're, we're, we're running for a very serious deal. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We're pressing for, toward a pretty... Pretty uh, serious mark. Amen. You know, and we don't just run because we like running. We don't just run because we like cardio, you know. Right. We run so we can achieve what God has set before us, so we can give it our all every Amen. step of the way. Amen. You know, I haven't been around too tremendously long, but I think we all can agree that life has a way of being unpredictable. Amen. You know, we make plans and we set goals, and it seems like as soon as we try to apply those to our lives, there's a new obstacle that, well, that's not happening anymore. <laughs> and it's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. But... More often than not, a lot of the times, we think it better to give up on our personal goal than to put forth the extra effort required to maintain it, even with God. Mm -hmm. We so easily let our faith get out of shape. Mm -hmm. Would you all stand with me this evening? Thank you, Lord. I want to challenge us, especially our youth leaving for convention. When you're seeking God, you don't have to settle for less. The altar is a place that's just between you and God. Brother Frankfurt preached a masterpiece, you know, an audience of one. Mm -hmm. It's just between you and God. There is so much more that God can do and so much more that he wants to do in your life than you realize. Mm -hmm. It's when we're willing to take a step into something that's not comfortable, something that's not familiar, that we give God the chance to do yes. something unforgettable in our yes, lives. Yes, Lord yeah. Jesus. Yeah. God bless all of those who joined us on Facebook Live. God bless you. I just want to open these altars to give somebody a chance to trust God in ways that you've never trusted God before, to reach out to God in ways that you haven't reached out to Him before in a really long time. Today is the day to exercise your faith. Now is the time to put your faith to action. Now is the time. Hallelujah.